Hello, everybody. Welcome to the celebration of life for Janelle Mouton's dinner. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Some of you came very long distances. Um, the first thing I want to say is I found out through this process of life that you can't pre-prepare for death. Like, I thought I was ready for my mom's passing. I wasn't. Um, and you never can pre-prepare grief, I've learned. Uh, so we're going to get to stories because there was two things my mom liked about funerals. Um, she loved the storytelling, she loved the laughs, and she loved for people to get involved and like really enjoy the celebration. Like, and so don't be afraid to laugh today. There's going to be some great stories. And don't be afraid to tell a story. You know, My mom, when we would go to a funeral, she would always say, who's in charge? Y'all know my mom, right? She would be lying to that person. Are they going to tell stories at some point? Uh, no, we didn't have that. Well, can they tell stories? Can I tell a story? So um, if you have a story, please tell it. I don't care how well you know her. If you have one story and you only met her once, please tell the story if you're called to. Um, so I'm going to tell a couple stories to end it um, once we've all uh, had a few stories. But we're going to start with my father, Terry Zinner. We'll start us off with a couple things to say. Well, the tears finally came <laughs> as I was sitting here and really now realizing all the love that's in the room here. It's, it's very much appreciated. I can't say enough. Um, I, I lost a lot of sleep thinking of what I was going to say here and concluded that uh, I, I have to wing it. I always do better if I wing it. So um, I'm going to start by uh, describing some, maybe most of you, don't know that Janelle was born a triplet. She, uh, a, a little boy was, was stillborn. Her sister lived 24 hours, and she's, she lived 80 years, 81 years. <laughs> so <laughs> she outdid them all, and uh, I'd like to picture her mom and dad. They, they went, her older, her only other sibling that's living is, is well, he's not living anymore either. Uh, ten, he was 10 years older than her. Um, and one of the interesting things that happened to our family is, is that she, Janelle, would, would uh, talk about her mother and dad and her brother a lot, uh, more than normal everyday life. I mean, she, they were definitely in her head and in her heart. Um, so I'm trying to think of, where, where I was going next, and uh, it might have taken me a while. Um, there's a picture, I don't know what happened to it, it's a, a little short little picture of Janelle in a rice field. She made it, she, she was a cover girl at age four. <laughs> rice, rice magazine uh, put her on, on, on the front page. So her dad was always very proud of that. And uh, she was, not really, he would not let many people take her on, on the tractor to go out in the field. And her mother didn't like that either, but he would take her and, and have her on his lap to plan to uh, be on the, on the tractor, and that was a big, proud moment for her. So uh, <clears throat> then I'm gonna skip ahead, I think, to uh, a little bit about I don't want to make this about me at all, but, but we have so many things in common. Uh, her dad was a grocer in Perry, Louisiana for about 10 years. My dad was a lifelong grocer in Buckman, Minnesota, which is about, about twice as big as Perry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we both had that, that grocery background and uh, Super Catholic, both families were super Catholic. I, I must have done hundreds of servings at Mass. Uh, being the only server in town of about 200 people, um, I would get called on when the, when the book server, Mass server wouldn't show up at seven o'clock in the morning. I would have to hustle over there. And uh, so I had a deep indoctrination of, of Catholicism and, and it led me to uh, I also, just to show you how Catholic I came from, my dad came from a family of 11, three of which were Benedictine nuns. <laughs> so, uh, heavy stuff. 
<laughs> Like, likewise, uh, Janelle entered uh, college at uh, Novitiate in New, New Orleans. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, if anybody here from New Orleans, they might be, be able to rattle that off. But, uh, Sacred Heart? It was my car, I think. <clears throat> I, I don't remember the name of it, actually. But anyway, uh, after I was through, through uh, my college years, and she was through hers, she went to, uh, she went to, uh, from, from the novitiate in New Orleans, she went to finish her college at Our Lady of the Lake in San Antonio. Had a degree in history there, and later, I met her there on, on my last two days in San Antonio before I went to Minnesota and then Vietnam. Um, so uh, we had one date, and that's where I, I shared with me with her. Uh, I really, my, my college favorite book was not much of a book, but it was, it was uh, Gospel According to Peanuts, <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful book that, that shared some easy to understand theology. Uh, so, we had one date in San Antonio, and uh, I think, <laughs> I think I kissed her. I'm, it's terrible to say I don't remember, <laughs> it's terrible to say I don't remember but uh, we, we, we both resolved that we would write to each other. And that turned into uh, letters that went from Abbeville, and she, she had moved from San Antonio to LSU in Baton Rouge, and uh, so I would send letters to LSU. She would send them to my hometown, Buckman, Minnesota. And uh, I got to Vietnam and, and there were no letters coming. And I thought that was kind of strange because we, we, we had a real connection there. And so uh, I finally called my mother. And it turns out, I, I can't repeat her words. I don't know if they're repeatable. She, she wasn't a big fan of uh, my getting involved with somebody from Louisiana. <laughs> and likewise, uh, the Moutons were not a big fan of her getting involved with a Minnesotan. So we, we shared that uh, cross-culture, and, and both, both cultures were much appreciated by the other. And, and uh, it was a big part of, of, uh, of my life uh, to live down here. I've been here for 50 years now. Um, so we started, we, we early on abandoned letters and decided to use how many, you, most of you are probably old enough to remember the old open reel tape recorders, about that big. Reel to reel. Pardon? Reel to reel. Reel to reel, yeah. And so I went to the local PX early on and it was the only time I got to the PX in a whole year's time there. <clears throat> but I got that, that tape recorder in hand, and she got one, and I mailed her her first tape. Well, we got to know each other. Our courtship basically was on tape, and, uh, and we still have the tapes. I still have mine from, from her, and I, there's a few of mine uh, that, I, that I got from, uh, to, to her that I got back. So that, there's a box full in our closet of, of that history, and it's really something. Um, <clears throat> Where do I go from here? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I got back from Vietnam, and she lived in Gretna, and I lived in Harvey. And uh, we would cross that. She was teaching at West Jefferson High at the time. And uh, uh, one day we were dri driving over the Mississippi River Bridge to cross from written it to New Orleans, and I happened to say to her, and I don't again remember my exact words, but uh, to the effect that I'm not big on, on uh, makeup, you know, put a little lipstick on, that's fine with me. That, that ingrained in her head where she was when she heard that, <laughs> going, going, over, going over the bridge in New Orleans. She never forgot where she heard that, because I was held to that for now. No, she, she, didn't, she, she didn't help me that. You know, I was, I was, I really meant what I said. Uh, I, I wasn't a huge person, a big person. I was a big person. I'm getting bigger. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, hold that against her for sure, because I was, I was as equally as comfortable with it as she was. <coughs> so I got back, 
and uh, uh, got to the New Orleans airport, and doggone, it was hotter than Saigon. <laughs> this is the old term for the capital of Vietnam. Uh, it was hot, humid, very, very similar, but even hotter at the New Orleans airport where she picked me up. <coughs> so uh, I was going somewhere with this. Where was it? Uh, <laughs> give me a minute. I think I told you already. It was about the lipstick. <laughs> okay, so so we got married, and, and uh, well, that that's the other story I was missing. For a year, we, we uh, I, I courted her in from New Orleans to to uh, Abbeville almost once a week. That's a three-hour drive one way before the interstate was there. So. Um, We, we talked through those months from August of 67 to uh, no, August of 68 to August of 69. We uh, started talking about uh, plans, you know, for the wedding and all. And it never occurred to me uh, how I was, what language I was using, but she kept using if we get married. And finally I said to her, what's with this if shit? <laughs> that was my proposal. <laughs> I, I dare to repeat that to a, a handful of couples that I was counseling with. Uh, they got a kick out of it too, and, and she she was amused by that too. So her parents have been wonderful to me, and, and they of course pass on. And um, my parents were wonderful to her too. Uh, we we. I always enjoyed our trips to Minnesota. One of the thoughts that I, went through my head was, it's not particularly, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just share it and then you make of it what you will, but we were sitting at the dining room table in Buckman, Minnesota, and uh, my mother had made homemade chicken soup. And Janelle said, what's the secret? How, how do you make it? And my mother said, well, it takes an old hen. And Janelle said, oh, you're not that old. <laughs> she, 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 was a, she was the butt of that joke, I guess. But she took it well, too. So that's, that's us. Uh, it's been a wonderful 55 years we were married, and, and uh, I never regretted any of it. it was just, she, was, she was a sweetheart, a uh, big heart, and a uh, beautiful person. We've got involved in politics, but I won't talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Joseph, you're yeah. or you want to Sorry, you, you can come up here and see. You guys here in the back, or do we need to turn the air off? Everybody's good? Okay, great. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, um, Mom always said that we were smart because I mean, she watched Dr. Doc, doc, um, Phil Donahue. For those of you too young, it's kind of like the Dr. Phil, but the, her day. Dr. Phil said, uh, Phil Donahue said, if you talk to your kids a lot, you'll be, you know, they'll be smart and whatever. And I was like, I got this. So, <laughs> so, um, anyway, they were, I'll talk a little bit about her activism because she was very, very, very kind and gave a lot of her time. Um, she was one of three people who had the uh, keys to Karen Crow High. There was the janitor, the principal, and mom. Wow. She, I'm sorry, she, it was the janitor, the principal, and mom. Um, she would get there so early, and then if somebody was struggling, she was willing to stay after school. No, char I mean she was just there a lot. No, you know, so and I figured that, that over 36 years of teaching, she's probably impacted about 3,500 kids. So, um, and she would. One of the things I thought that was great is that she's 410, and she would go. These like six two football players were coming like, Rrr, and they were getting in a fight, and she'd go right in the middle and go, cut it out. And they got separated. <laughs> the little old lady and these, these, these big new guys. And then the other thing that like kids would be, like hold hands and stuff like that, and um, they weren't supposed to do that. And so she would go right up behind him and she goes, "La, there's a many many thing." And they'd like separate right up. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was um, a member of, of, of former, of one of the founding members of Common Cause, and she also was. A lot of people don't know this. But in the 1980s, um, the 
lot of the snowbirds would come down to Louisiana um, that were homeless. And so she and Father Segura and three other volunteers went to New Orleans to, to scope out how we could start a, um, a soup kitchen. And so she was one of the founding members of St. Joseph's Diner. And if, for those of you who don't know, um, it has grown since it started in 1983. And today they serve about 125 people at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I figured that's another couple thousand people that she's impacted. Um, let's see. And she volunteered at Faith House a lot. That's a battered women's shelter. That's why she, we put that as like a thing for people to do. So I know because I was with her a lot of those times. So Common Cause, Faith House, St. Joseph Steiner, teaching for 36 years. I think she did a really good job. And she, I mean, she's a great mom for, for me and Joseph. So that's all I got. Thank you. I was just going to open it up for anyone that wants to stand up and come take a, uh, tell a story. Thank you, Mark. I'm Mark Bergio. I'm uh, one of Joseph's uh, closest friends. Uh, going back to early in high school, uh, yeah, we, he, he was the best man in my wedding, I served in his wedding. Uh, spent a lot of time in that house through high school and college over the years. Uh, one thing you could count on, any of us as Joseph's friends, uh, we basically were, uh, we became basically additional children to her. That you know, you know that's that's Miss Janelle. That's just how she was, and you could always see the love and caring from her anytime we saw her, and even if there was a little bit of disappointment from her, there was a time in high school I lent Joseph my Andrew Dice Clay tapes to him. She found <laughs> she found them. He he had to write me out, of course. <laughs> And so she banned me from the house for two weeks. <laughs> but, but Andrew Dice Clay rates way much lower than not voting for Bill Clinton in 1992. <laughs> that got me a one month ban. <laughs> so, and, and you know Mr. Nell, so you know where that pecking order went. Uh, went. Because uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was gone, family, Bill Clinton, <laughs> <laughs> and and I was probably and and then I said they were out of town and uh, Joseph may or may not have had a little party at the house uh, <laughs> one weekend about halfway into that band and then they they got home, uh, Miss Chanel and uh, Miss Terry got home and and we had all slept in the house and so I'm there and Miss Chanel said didn't I ban you for a month but I mean of course. <laughs> She was just joking. It, it, it was more symbolic than anything else. It wasn't an she actual was ban, it was a joke. It was to get, to get, her, point, to get her point across. <laughs> but so one thing you can always count on is you know, that nothing ever changed. Even I got to see her when Joseph came to town for a friend's wedding about a, um, a, early last month. You know, got to see her. And even though the recognition of me and my son was not there anymore for her. One thing that never changed. You could see the caring and love in her face, no matter what. Even, you know, even if the memory wasn't there anymore. And that's one thing you could always count on. So I was glad to get to see her one more, uh, one last time recently. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm Janelle's first cousin, and we um, grew up together, and my earliest memory was going over to spend the night at her house on the farm, and I was looking at the picture of the, farm, the farmhouse that they had. Um, it was built around 1900, and we had a big, they had a big front porch that wrapped around, and we had, um, we'd play around on the porch with the frogs, but we wouldn't play with the rooster. We were afraid of the rooster. <laughs> but we 
walked around the, far, the farm and we found a graveyard in the back of the, the back of the farm and we also saw um, um, a calf being born that day um, that we were walking around and um, we, um, when she'd come to visit we would visit uh, one of the things um, Anne has heard that a lot <laughs> about the when uh, we would visit on Sundays, a lot of families would visit on Sunday. But when Janelle would go to, to church with her, her family on Sunday, uh, uh, her mother would say, well, if you're good in church, we'll stop by the Abers and, and, um, and visit with the Abers. So we, I remember them coming in on, after Mary's coming in on Sunday, we'd read the comics and we'd, we'd play cards and, um, Janelle said every card game she learned was at our house. <laughs> she learned everything. Yeah. And uh, at the end of visiting during the summer, I would go back with them and spend the night with them on, on the farm. Um, we, um, we went, we, as I said, we grew up, and as we got older, one of the, um, as Curtis was 10 years older, and so his his girlfriend that later became his wife, they was was very um, helpful to us as we were growing up. So I, I think she really helped Janelle, you know, go in, transition into the teenage years. And she taught us how to dance, and she helped us find um, um, the radio station that we liked to listen to at um, at night was um, Nashville station, but it was an AM station, so the at atmospheric conditions permitted us to listen to Nashville, <laughs> and uh, Faye helped to find, find that on the, on the radio so that she could listen to that, and um, so we uh, went through high school, and um, Uncle Joe, you know, gave some advice to um, Janelle when she started to date, she said, Janelle, don't talk to them about religion or politics. <laughs> she said, well, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, she carried that pretty much throughout her life. <laughs> she was, um, and um, so I'm trying to, there's a lot to talk about, Janelle. Oh, you know, we, we went through the, uh, all through school together. We made our first communion together. We um, made confirmation together. And uh, we were in kindergarten and second grade together. That was only two years I went to Montcarnell. But after she graduated, it, she did go to the convent. Um, she entered as a novice so I, I, in New Orleans. And I was at LSU, so I was able to go by and, and visit her, you know. But, um, and I remember seeing her in, in her habit, and she came over and she, she said, look, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't going to stay. And she, she transferred at the end of the year. She went to Ali the Lake, and that, Terry gave you that story about meeting. Huh? Tell, tell the story about the, the dating service, service at LSU. You both fill out a form. What? The dating service. service. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it reminded me about that too. We, when, when she went to uh, she went to graduate school at LSU, also, and uh, I was still in, I was in law school at the time. So um, we they had a um, a computer dating service that was connected with the university. So we filled out a questionnaire, and the the first. Match was met uh, Janelle and I. <laughs> <laughs> but we were, yeah, we were very, like I said, we were very close. We grew up together. We had a lot of uh, shared uh, interests, and she was really more like a, sh a sister to. Um, in our family, and she was included in all our uh, celebrations, our you know our birthday celebrations, and um, 
holiday celebrations. We'd include Janelle and her family. They would they come and, um, but I would say, I just want you to know that Janelle lived um, the Beatitudes. She was, you know, she had the heart of Jesus in her. And so I know that we're going to see her one day whenever God wipes all our tears away. I forget because I know I'm going to forget if I don't tell you now because it's a funny one. We spent a lot of time at the farm at my at Mama and Papa Mouton's house. We had a Mama and Papa bouquet with those <laughs> girls over there on the other side of the family <sighs> and we were so lucky to have such loving, supportive, cut off their right arm if they needed to for their grandkids. And Zoe and Joseph experienced that same thing. So we were there a lot, but the thing that you remember is the more you, the older you are, the more you remember, right? Because you're, you're there in the moment you know. The first time I ever saw her cry was a shock to me because although we knew what was going on, we didn't understand the depths of it because we were so much younger, but I remember uh, when JFK was assassinated, I remember her sitting with a tissue on the couch about, about this far from the TV, and she was sobbing, and Mama was standing there wringing her hands, and I went, what's wrong? And it was Denise's birthday, and I thought, aren't we supposed to be happy on people's birthdays? But it was just so sad that I realized what was going on, and then I realized that was why she was crying. She literally adored that man, and everyone was, was crying at that point in time. But the funny part, the funny one, was when I was a lot older, I think I was 15 when y'all got married, and I was in your wedding, and that's why I was at, at the house, and they went off on a honeymoon, and they came back to the house and the, you could hear people drive up the driveway because of the gravel and they went, oh, they're home, they're home. So I went to the front door and I opened the door and I said, hi. She goes, hi. I said, you're back from your honeymoon. Yeah. I said, what did y'all do? <laughs> <laughs> I was just 15, I didn't know. And, and so, uh, you should have seen the look on her face. She, she kind of went like this, well, uh, 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 we had fun. <laughs> so yeah, so there was just so much love. She, she was kind of like a substitute mother to us and took so much care. I'll never forget her. Her job was to sleep on the floor with us. My mom would make a big pallet and we would all, the four, two, three or four of us, five, would sit on the, would sleep on the floor on a pallet when we were there with them. And her job was to lay down with us and make sure that we stayed quiet and tried to sleep until we were asleep. And once we slept, she could get up and leave. But poor thing, now that I do that to my grand, with my grandchildren, I, I realize how dedicated she was. And I can't think of anything else to tell you, but thank you so much. She was such a loving, wonderful thing. And she was my godmother. Oh, that's the other thing. She got special dispensation, right? Byron oh, knows. <laughs> Byron, she got special dispensation. She used to tell me the story all the time. You know, Monica, I had to get special dispensation when I was 12 years old to be your godmother. So that always made me feel so special because she was just like the little sister to my mom. So that part was so special because she, I didn't want to feel like I was better than my brothers and sisters. <laughs> but it sure helped. It sure helped. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wait, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Oh, Just one second. Go. One second. Go okay, you go first. Yeah. Good to see you again. It's been ages. My name is Lee Keys, and my wife Sandy and I have got about a four and a half decade friendship with Terry and Janelle. We were neighbors across the street. We raised each other's kids. We did everything you could think of. They were just the best people in the world to be neighbors with. And uh, and at times I had to keep kind of keep Terry uh, uh, protected because he would do things like one day he came over and he wanted to, I had gathered up all the leaves in the yard, which is about 25 bags of leaves, and he comes over and asked me for the leaves. And I said, sure, because he wanted to fertilize his garden with them. So he took all the leaves over to his house, fertilized his garden, the first norther that came in blew all the leaves into, <laughs> into the other neighbor's yard. Of course, he would live it, he had to go pick up all those leaves and get rid of them again. But, but we all laughed about it. We, we, it was fun to, to do that. But uh, as some of y'all may be aware, Janelle leaned a little bit to the left of the political side. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. She leaned a lot of the way to the left. And so I would always pick at her about it. I'd come over and say, Janelle, did you hear about the, the Democrat that went to uh, join the Republican Party? And she'd give me this look and then her friend said, tell me about the Democrats with the Republican Party. And I'd tell her the joke and she'd laugh. She'd just die laughing about it. And I'm sure that whenever she got to the pearly gates, the first thing she asked Sam Peter, tell me you are a Democrat. <laughs> Because if he was, that she was fixing to convert him. <laughs> but we uh, we had a lot of times together. Uh, God, I was kind of the the neighborhood uh, handyman. I'd come over and fix things all the time. Whatever it was, I could generally fix everything. And and Terry, bless his heart, was born with two left thumbs. <laughs> Sometimes I'd use his left thumb to hold something down as I fixed it, you know. But uh, she would call me one day. She called me and she said. Boy, uh, our field bed has stopped up, you know, and I can't flush the commodes or anything. I said, can you come help me to see what to do? So I grabbed my neighbor Carl Redmond up the street, and he and I came down there, and we figured, well, what we need to do is dig down in the backyard and find that drain line where the effluent off the septic system would be carried away. So we started digging it. Three days later, we had a canyon dug. <laughs> I swear this thing must have been, what, 15 feet deep and five feet wide and 40 feet long. We still didn't find that drain line, but we dug such a, such a hell of a ditch that we hauled in two dump truck full of gravel and filled it up with gravel and that became a new field bed, you know. <laughs> but we would always do things like that. And Sandy, my wife Sandy, and her, and Bobby Potan, were three peas in a pot. Those three were close all these years. They would meet for their birthdays every year. And even though we moved away and went on to Houston and other places, they were still friends and right up, right up to now. And uh, those who know Bobby Potan, she's had a stroke and she's in the hospital now. And she's really struggling with this thing. So uh, your prayers for her, please, if you would. But it's hard to look at Janelle without looking at Terry as well, because they were, they were a unit. I mean, that's how, that's how they were. And, uh, and everything was always Terry and Janelle. It wasn't Terry, it wasn't Janelle, it was always Terry and Janelle, you know? And whenever my wife and I would talk, we would always, we always do what the other was talking about, just saying Terry and Janelle. So their kids and our kids grew up together and uh, and all I can say, she was a she was a hell of a woman. She really was, and I'm proud to have known her. Thank you. I'm Amelia Bellone, and I met Janelle through her first cousin, Claudette Mouton. 
who was my best friend at the time. And through Janelle, of course, like Lee said, I had to meet Terry. And Terry, like me, was a social worker and I was looking for a job. So it was a perfect uh, connection, which led to more than 30 years of friendship with both of them. And <clears throat> people have already said a lot of things about Janelle that I would have said. So I just want to add a few things. One is that Janelle was a really kind person. She was the kind of person that if, she, if you looked sad or a little worried or even just quiet, she would check. What's going on? Are you okay? What's happening? And she would listen with real interest and very quickly she'd have some advice. <laughs> But it was always pretty good advice, too. So I valued that. I valued her opinions. And one of her little kindnesses that I remember especially is that when my husband and I got married about 25 years ago, Janelle and Terry gave us a few little gifts. And one of them was a vegetable peeler, like a potato peeler. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. You know, how many people are gonna give you a potato peeler for a wedding, <laughs> right? And, but I was fine. We thought it was a great thing. We could use it. Well, Janelle then later sat down and explained to me the company that it came from and the quality that it was and what a great tool it was and how she had the rest, a set like it with knives and everything in her kitchen. And I thought, okay, this, this is gonna be good. Well, really, truly, just a couple of days ago, I was using that potato peeler thinking of Janelle, thinking all these years later, this thing works really great. She knew what she was talking about. <laughs> but that's how she was. She was kind, she was practical, she was humble. I have many friends who have worked at or had children at, for example, Karen Crow High School. And <clears throat> I would always say, oh, I know somebody who teaches over there, you know, Janelle Zenner. And always there'd be a compliment. Oh, Ms. Zenner, she is great. She is so interesting. She'll make you do these odd homework assignments, but then we get into these very interesting discussions, and she, she it, it was clear she was opening people's minds and stretching them in directions that they weren't used to being stretched in. Maybe some of that left-leaning stuff, but I think even beyond that, she was trying to help them see that the world is a whole lot bigger than what they were used to thinking about here. and. I think about when I would occasionally write a letter to the editor of the newspaper on something I felt passionate about, Janelle always read the newspaper, always spotted my letters to the editor, and she would call me up and she'd give me compliments and then she'd give me pointers. <laughs> and here's how you write the follow-up letter. <laughs> and you know what? She was right, always, and smart. So to me, Janelle <clears throat> was the kind of friend that was smart, she was kind, she was interesting, and she did always tell great stories and great jokes. I wish that I had written more of them down so I would remember them. I'd have a collection of Janelle stories. We'll have to just keep telling them to each other as we do remember because I will never forget Janelle. I loved her very much, and I was so happy to be part of her world and close to her family. Thank you. She has four albums and letters to the editors, by the so, way. So I just want to announce that um, this is halftime. I, uh, I was sleeping when my dad called me to confirm this time. 
Um, <laughs> I am aware this is the middle of the LSU game. We're not done. We got some more stories. But I'm going to say that uh, if anyone wants to leave and go catch the LSU game, there will be absolutely no judgment. Um, I know Nini caught the first quarter. Good job on that one, by the way. Um, so we're going to keep going. If anyone wants to leave, there's no judgment if you want to catch the end of the LSU game. It's my fault for scheduling it this time. What's, what's, What's the score? Let me look it up. Let me look it up. 7-7 when we got here. Someone's on their phone checking the score. Mark, come on. I know you're on the phone checking the score. Let's see. 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 let us from high school and I wanted to follow up the last speaker because um, you made a po so many points that I connected with. Um, Ms. Janelle, when I met her, I was from a very conservative um, Catholic home and I, come, I came from parents who did not allow you to um, think freely or speak freely. <laughs> And when I met her, she challenged me on everything that I said and did. Um, from putting on my makeup, um, and she, sa she says, who are you putting that on for? <laughs> um, and I had no answer. Um, I'm, well, and then she told me that when she was going across the bridge in New Orleans, <laughs> um, <laughs> that Mr. Terry had told her that if he, if if you were doing that for me, you do not need to do it ever again. And this was very impactful to her. Um, and she said, "So I don't know who you're doing it for, Jenny, but you need to think about it because." You don't need to do it for anybody except if you want to do it for yourself. And so oftentimes I ask myself, to, even to, still to today when I'm putting on makeup, who am I putting this on for? Who am I, you know, exactly what am I thinking? And, and so she challenged me. She, we went to a funeral. I was at her mama's funeral. And she said, she always spoke to me like this. Jenny, at my funeral, do not let them say a rosary. And, 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 and see, I was coming from a Catholic family. I knew she had been Catholic. I knew, why is this woman telling me this? Everything was a challenge to me. And so um, I would leave her and, and always take nuggets of what did, why is she saying that? How does she, how does she feel and why does she say that? I need a tissue. Um, and so, so she, she, she told me that, and, and the, the flip side to that is she always spoke to me as if I was going to be in her life forever. She never, it was never an ending. She talked to me about her funeral. She told me at Mark's wedding, Mark who spoke here, that she wanted me to sing for her funeral. She always spoke to me as if she was going to know me forever which gives you a feeling of love, of acceptance, of, of non-judgmental, just um, acceptance and love, always. Um, and so another example, which I was not gonna share, but I will. Um, <laughs> after being drunk one night, <laughs> morning and I was the cantor at mass and so I knew that I had to get up at like 7 a.m. and I was in the same dress I went to the club in the night before <laughs> and I said to myself how am I going to get out of here I my car was there but it was hidden and I had slept over at their house because apparently Joseph was drunk too but we ended up there sleeping so I woke up and I thought to myself I can't go out the back door because they're, if they're in the living room, they're going to see me. And I can't go out the garage door because if they're in the, it's the same room. You know, it was all the same room. And I thought if I go out the front door, the, they might have an alarm that goes off. And so I, I have to face the music. And it's 7 a.m. on Sunday. 
And I'm, I, before I even got to the, the, the door of the living room, I hear her say, hey, Jenny, how do you want your eggs? <laughs> so even in my dread, in my, if, and I won't even tell you what my mother would have said if Joseph would have come out of the back <laughs> of my house um, at that moment uh, in my, you know, in our 20s, it would have not been, but it, but it was consistent. She was very consistent in her, in her acceptance and love and, and just all of the things. She, she spoke to me always like I was an equal to her. Um, she asked for my advice. One time she called me and asked me if she needed help with Joseph. He was in Atlanta. Would I go with her? Would I call him? Could I help her with, I said, I cannot help you with Joseph. <laughs> I said, you, you have taught him and raised him all of these years to think whatever he wanted to think and do the things to go where his heart led him. And now that is what he is doing. All of these things, he is, he is he's a free thinker. I can't, can't do that. I can't, I'm not calling him and I'm not going with you to help him to be something different than exactly who he is. And, and I don't know what she, she thought of that, but she was fine with it. You know, she, she didn't, she didn't, um, she didn't, you know, fuss at me or, 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 or treat me different. Um, she would challenge me so many times, and but part of that, all of the challenges was love. Um, always love because of, and, and, and acceptance. And so I know that one time at a, a friend's funeral, one of our, our friend's mothers died. So similar to what we have today where friends are gathered, the mother has died and the funeral happened and they opened the floor up to, for someone to speak. And Ms. Janelle was there, I was there. No one spoke. And um, she looked at me, neither of us had ever met the lady, but we, had, we knew the son well. And it was, it, was, it was horrifying. I mean, it was embarrassing, really. Um, and so when we got out of the, the funeral ended and she and I are talking, I said, Ms. Janelle, I wanted to say something so bad. She said, oh God, I wanted to say something so bad. She said, I said, I could have just said that she must have been a wonderful mother because she had a wonderful son, you know, my friend. Why didn't you say that? You could have said that. I didn't know the lady, but you could have said that. You know, um, so it, she was a beautiful lady. She taught me a lot of things as a young woman um, I, I say woman, I'm losing that term loosely. As a young girl, um, when I met her, she um, showed me love and acceptance, her and Mr. Terry both, and, um, and really nurtured me through, into after my getting married, having children, they've been with me and encouraged me and um, loved me through that whole time. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I know, know her and that um, she was such a part of my life. So, thank you. My name is Frank Dawkins, uh, across the street neighbor from the Zinners. Uh, I'm a Yankee from Shreveport. <laughs> where, else, where else do you get called the Yankee but in Lafayette if you're from Shreveport? <laughs> so uh, I really wanted just to share the uh, thankfulness that I feel for such great neighbors as the Zinners have been to us. You know, we, uh, my wife and I got married at Crystal in uh, 79 and we first lived in Shreveport. Uh, where I was an assistant U.S. attorney, and uh, Byron, I haven't seen you in a long time. He was a, he was a federal magistrate, later district judge here in, La, in uh, from Abbeville in the 15th JDC. So um, I handle a, a bunch of cases down here in federal court from 79 to 82, and I always really liked Lafayette when I came down here. Man, and that was in the days before there were many hotels. I mean, 
a lot of times during the week you couldn't even find a, 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 a motel or hotel room because they're already booked with business people traveling. And I have to spend the night in people's houses, you know, and guest bedrooms and stuff. And uh, you know, back then people didn't usually make a career out of working for the for the Department of Justice because it didn't pay that much, and you gain the experience and then move into private practice. So I was looking to move on and. Uh, happened to uh, luck into uh, a job offer down here. And so we moved down here in March of 82 and um, we were dealing with a, a young female uh, real estate agent and she heard about this house on our street, North Loxley off of Collie Saloon, uh, that was fixing to go on the multi-listing market. And so we got a chance to see it, you know, before it officially went on sale and we, Said, yeah, this is great. So we 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 offered the asking price and, and, and bought it. Well, uh, we were so lucky to have such great neighbors as the Zinners, the Keys uh, next door. Uh, Lee's Lee's one of the smartest guys I've ever known. Man, he could fix anything. <laughs> he he actually connected all the houses. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, but I think he connected all the houses in our neighborhood when it was built. Everybody was on septic system and water wells. I think he connected all the houses on our block to city water and city sewage. And I don't, that's an incredible thing. Um, but over the years, you know, <laughs> what's that? Is that legal? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but. Um, Terry and Janelle were, you know, have always been such great neighbors, and we've always appreciated Ann babysat for us when uh, Claire, our daughter, who's here, uh, and our son Will were, were young. And uh, I, I always look forward to uh, Christmas time. Uh, Terry would call me and say, uh, "You want some grapefruit and oranges? We, they're they're uh, they're ready for picking." He had he had the most incredible fruit trees in his backyard. I mean. The best grape, uh, ruby red grapefruit you ever ate, and uh, man, I literally just get all I could carry home, you know, and uh, sacks full, you know, and until the freeze <laughs> a few years ago, I've got some of those trees, unfortunately. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, we were just really fortunate to uh, move into such a, you know, friendly and open neighborhood with such, you know, great neighbors and. Uh, it's hard to believe we've been there for over 40 years now. You know, we were <laughs> kind of the newcomers at the time, you know, and the, the Zinners were there, the Keys were there, there were other people that had been in the neighborhood uh, already uh, as well. There's been some turnover since, but uh, as, as things always do change, you know. But anyway, I just uh, wanted to say, you know, how important it is to me to connect with, with the people that you live around, you know, and, and uh, and then we have the Prathers around the corner. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Andy and Kathy, who live next door to where the Keys used to live. Uh, so, you know, it's just a great area. And uh, I've always told people, man, I've lived in, I grew up in Shreveport. I lived in New Orleans, practiced law down there for a year, couldn't stand it. Uh, it's a great place to visit if you want to live there. Baton Rouge, went to law school at LSU. Lafayette's the best place to live in the state of Louisiana. Thank you. Yay, Eagles. <laughs> Janelle and I went to Mount Carmel of Abbeville, and my husband also. We had a very 
small class and a close-knit class, still to this day. But I can always remember Janelle, her favorite thing, you all right. You gained all these graces. I said, yes, Janelle, I know I'm gaining the graces, but I'm losing them as fast as I gain them. <laughs> she said, no, she said, it's always for keeps. So Janelle, all these people that have come up here and spoke about you have gained beautiful graces. But it was so hard growing up in a small town. We didn't know anybody, I didn't, I mean, you know, is not a big metropolis, but I think that's why class of 60 won with such a close-knit class. And Terry knows we used to have lunch once a month until we got a little too old or illness set in. But it's just that Janelle always always but each one of us had a good good thing to say about us she never criticized and if somebody would criticize she'd go boo ha ha <laughs> and that was one of her things boo ha ha and go away <laughs> but she always had a smile always had a smile and I just wanted to come up here as a classmate to tell her, yes, you did gain all these graces, you're all right. You got it made. So, ladies and gentlemen, this person was an angel. And she has been a, she has been a great friend to both Essie and I for years and years. And like they said, Terry and Janelle <laughs> go together. <laughs> but you know, Terry, as he said to tell you, if you ever need anything, give a call. We are still there. Okay? Love you both. Be good. We have one more I'd love to hear from you, Miss Sandy. Come on. Thank you, Sandy. I have a really soft voice, so I hope you all can hear me. And my relationship with Janelle was mostly soft because she gave in a lot to me. Um, she asked me questions and I said, okay, <laughs> I would go along with it. Uh, what is it? Uh, Jenny said, she, she challenged you a lot. She did me too and I grew up a lot. Um, the story though is that uh, I think uh, you and Janelle moved in uh, whichever year it was, 74, 74. 74. and uh, in April, that March, and two, a couple of months later, Lee and I moved in, <clears throat> and um, so we were catty corner, and um, they had two little children, and Lee and I didn't have kids at that time, and I was so baby hungry, and, and uh, Zoe and, and Joseph were right there soaking up all the attention I could give them and so um, and then Bobby who lived next door to me and right across the street had uh, Cherie and Candy and Ross was about Joseph's age right so the, all the kids got together at Janelle and Terry's and the three of us Bobby and Janelle and I would uh, do um, needlepoint embroidery all kinds of that kind of so it was really the quiet years where <coughs> she was taking care of the little ones. Um, she wasn't working then, right? I know y'all went to uh, Miss Shannon's. Uh, Miss Shannon, is that a Monticello school? No, it was a Baker. Mon Monticello. Sorry. No, it was a Baker. Oh, it was a Baker. 
So, you know, we did that kind of thing. And um, as I said, it was quiet, very personal. Um, and I think uh, I would have been in my mid-20s. Janelle was probably 30 and Bobby was 35. So we really were kiddos. So we didn't realize. But all these years, um, I mean, we've known each other for five uh, decades. And every day, um, every moment that we were able to spend together were really gifts. Um, and I'm so sorry that I missed being with her those last few weeks and days. Um, I have had a lot of um, sorrow and loss in my family in uh, well, this year. Um, and I didn't even share that with her. It was just, it was too hard to, to offer to anybody. But I do know what she would have said. And she would have given me the best hugs. So um, it is a privilege that I knew her. And I, it's hard to think that she's gone. But I will say y'all were so close that I, I'm, I feel her everywhere. Uh, and unfortunately, I did not bring the picture that I uh, got brought of her and Bobby and I uh, when I'd come to town as we moved uh, to Houston in 2000. Um, we would always go out to eat and have a picture taken. So I have all those memories too. Um, there was something someone mentioned. I'm trying to think. Jenny, was that Cutco? No, yes. Amelia. Cutco. It was Amelia. Amelia. Oh. It was Cutco, yes. Uh, she, yes, that was something. They had um, a magnetic thing that they put their knives on in the kitchen, uh, which, of course, I thought was completely ridiculous because it was not child-proof if the child climbed. But anyway, <laughs> her, knives, her knives were Cutco knives. And she kept telling me how great they were. And I think they actually gave my daughter and my son, uh, one of the special knives when they got married. So she, that was her favorite. She did that all the time. Um, and so when my son graduated, she was so excited because I bought a whole set of Cutco for oh. a friend of his. It was fundraising. She was, she was so dear. There are so many facets of her. It's just hard to think of all of them. But um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's not a it wasn't a job to get here and uh, celebrate her life with you and our lives with you all. Thanks. My mom would have freaking loved this funeral. <laughs> I'm telling you, let me, let me tell you, my mom is loving this funeral. I wish we could have done it for her when she was alive to hear, uh, the, I mean, I'm being inspired to be a better person, reach out and reach more people, volunteer more, I don't know. Um, if you're uh, a little shy to get up and, and talk, uh, grab her only grandchild, Emily, and tell Emily a story about my mom after this, if you like. Um, and yeah, going back to Cutco, I'm glad you mentioned the name of it because she would have wanted that. She definitely worked for them. I actually worked for them in college. She's like, it's like she pushed it into me. So she sent her knives off every year to get sharpened because they do that for her. So, uh, and one thing, what's that? She loves gadgets. She loves gadgets. Um, one thing about the JFK story is uh, she actually saw JFK the day before in San Antonio, and she called her dad and she said, Dad. He has red hair. <laughs> they didn't know he was a redhead because black and white TVs back then. So she didn't realize he was a redhead until she saw his, uh, his thing. The other thing I wanted to say about stories that I've been told is when I called Jenny, I said, Jenny, um, the funeral director said that they're not sure if enough people are going to stand up to tell the story. So we're, they wanted us to reach out to tell a story. And she goes, oh, good. I thought you were going to ask me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll be singing after. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know, we do want Jenny to sing. Um, and then Monica wanted me to mention, uh, my parents signed up for a, a 
to foster children. And so we have a foster brother named Frank and a foster sister named uh, Tiffany that both wanted to be here and couldn't. Um, but they're like family to us. We had them for a few years. We were a temporary foster uh, camp, uh, for families in need. So that was just another cool thing that my parents did. So um, bless them for that. We've got an LSU update score, by the way. Greg, come on. Where you at? Emily, where you at? We'll get you a score in a second here. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Um, so one thing I wanted to say about, like, mom, many people said, like, spirited debate. But my mom wasn't trying to convert people to Democrat. My mom loved debating with people that were the opposite of her. Like Mike Zinner was one of her favorite people to catch at the reunion and debate with because they didn't see eye to eye. Like she loved sharing with people that didn't see and she wasn't trying to convert you. She was trying to see, let you see something from her point of view. She just wanted you to get the facts. You can be you. Like she wasn't trying to get you to be vote every way she voted. She wanted you to know the facts so you could vote according to your heart. And I think that's what kind of like we're missing these days is that spirited debate without hating on each other for being on different sides of the aisle. Like she was great about that. Like, cause me and her aren't aligned pol politically, but, and we were getting the spirited debate. My sister was like, you guys take it down. And me and mom were like, what are you talking about? We're not yelling, we're passionate. This isn't, this isn't anger, this is passion. You know, so I think we, uh, we could use to get back to some of that these days as you guys know what's going on in the world. Um, so one of the stories I wanted to tell, um, and, and oh, and by the way, reading her obituary, reading about all the Bow Camps and the Zinners and the Delahannies and the Mutons, things they wrote about my mom, go read them if you haven't read them, great stories. I realized she had been sparring with me when I started, when I became a teenager and we started debating. She had been sparring with my older cousins because I was the youngest cousin, so apparently she had been, you know, debating with all the older cousins before me. So I wanted to tell a story that's my favorite story to her. She actually tells it. I had her tell it about eight years ago on, on YouTube. If you want to get her to tell it, she's a way better storyteller than me. But this is how it goes. Um, she's at Our Lady of the Lake in San Antonio. And they started segregation. And my mom had a black roommate. Uh, their favorite restaurant that they used to go to started segregating, wouldn't letting black people in. So, you know. My mom's not gonna stand for that. Like, she's not just gonna say, oh, okay, that's what they're doing now, okay. No, she's gonna fix that. So they came up with a plan, they cooked up this plan. One of the, uh, the black guys that they hung out with, his dad actually was a Nigerian prince in his tribe. So he knew how to dress up in a Nigerian prince uh, jibe or whatever, the, in the prince guy. So he, he dressed up in American clothes and tried to go into the restaurant and they refused him entry. So they waited a few weeks and they called and they, they said, um, we have a Nigerian prince coming to town. We need to make an, uh, a reservation for five. You're gonna, we're going to have a consulate come in. And so they brought this Nigerian prince with four white people dressed up real nice and looked like a, you know the, the, the consulate from Nigeria had showed up. And so, boy, they treated him like they were royalty and whatnot. And uh, ate a nice, di nice dinner. And the next day, um, or maybe later that afternoon, I don't know, the same guy came back in American clothes and, of course, refused him service. So my mom and her friends took a picture of him as the uh, African prince and a picture of him in American clothes, and they brought it to the newspaper. And they said, this restaurant is serving African citizens over American citizens. Are you going to stand for that? And, and so, so they, and, and of course they had the boycott going the whole time, going back weeks. And that was already starting to work, so that worked. And they, and they desegregated this restaurant, and, and the rest of San Antonio kind of followed suit. Like, so they just weren't, they were like, segregation? No, I don't think so, not on our watch. They're like, we, we're smarter than you. We're going to out-segregate this restaurant. Um, another thing funny is that uh, Byron's dad, uh, Irby, um, we still to this day, my sister was just saying she still does it. We, um, my mom has a dead relative assigned to everything. And Uncle Irby is assigned to lost things, which we lose things all the time. So, she, so if you hear her say Uncle Irby, it means she's lost something and she's looking for it and she needs Uncle Irby's help. So, I, so I'm definitely going to be using my mom to call on her for, uh, for different things because obviously she's got a lot of wisdom. But that, I thought that was just a, a, a fun little side note. One more story for you guys and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, so when you go down my street, Loxley, um, lots of kids that play and stuff, and the miles per hour is 25 miles per hour, but there's no speed, limits, speed bumps or anything, so people would come racing through, a lot of teenagers in the neighborhood and stuff like that. And one of them was Kyle Takino, who some of you know, who would come speeding down the, the thing, and she would come running out, 25 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour. And, and 
Usually she'd get the finger. Um, these kids didn't care. And so about every three or four months, she'd call the cops and have them uh, sit at the corner down the road. And my mom would literally sit out in the lawn chair with popcorn. And these kids would come racing down. They're like, the crazy lady's not yelling. She's eating popcorn. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Take it out. Take it out. Take it. So every teenager in town knew that race down our street knew who my mom was and wasn't a fan. You know? <laughs> So that, and then Kyle later bought the house from his parents, which is three houses down, four houses down from us, whatever. He bought the house from his parents, and he walked down the street, and he knocked on our door, and he said, Mr. Janelle, I want to tell you, these kids are crazy. <laughs> we got to figure out a way to slow them down. So they started a, a, a petition, and they got speed bumps put on our street, so that's not a problem. But now, oddly enough, they put the speed bump in front of my house and in front of Kyle's house. So now the, our houses have to deal with the gang, 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 because the, the kids still come down there 60 or 70 miles an hour, but now they're ruining their car doing it. <laughs> so they've kind of come along on that. Um, so that's all the stories I have. I really appreciate you guys sitting through this, especially during an LSU game, and all of you guys that traveled to get here. We so appreciate that. If I haven't talked to you yet, please come talk to me. Come meet. Uh... Oh, what's the score? 17 10. 17 10. 10 LSU. Come meet me and Emily or, or come say hi to us. We really appreciate y'all being here. And the after party, for those that don't know, is that walk ons. The LSU game will be on, I would imagine. So walk-ons on the Kali Saloon, if anyone wants to join us over there, we're going to just uh, have a little bit more storytelling, probably. <laughs> so we're going uh, to have one more song uh, by Etta James called At Last, and then we'll wrap this up. If you want to leave now, you're welcome to. Thank you so much. Uh, uh.